So I think while we wait for people to come in from outside, why don't we just take a minute, and I'd love to hear from you, and you could just explain to people near you, what's the current status of debate and argument work in your schools and classrooms right now? Is it something that kids do a lot? Is it something they do a little? Do they do it when it's teacher-led? How do your families feel about it? What's your stance on argument? <laughs> um, because the truth is, when you want to start debate work, um, that's a, there's a whole uh, attitude toward debate that needs to be talked through, not just with teachers, but also in terms of your the whole culture in your school. Um, so just for a second, while people are kind of coming in and we're getting organized, um, just for a minute, why don't you tell some people near you, what does debate or argument look like in your building right now, okay? So you can talk with each other for a second. to children and young adults about why. Why get better at argument and debate? Because it will take, a, it takes work, right? To get better at argument and debate takes work. So the first thing you need to do is to think, what, what would be the reasons that you care about the most that you would want to say to children and young adults about why it would be worth it to get better at it? So for a minute, can you just compare with someone near you? What would be your top one or two reasons for why get better at argument and debate. Here, really quickly, let's just get there. What is debating So these are some reasons that they might not be exactly what you said, but some of the reasons that we're talking about. So the, I think the first and most important one is to learn to advocate. To advocate for yourself and to advocate for others. Right? This notion that you can learn to be compelling and persuasive in advocation. The second would be, um, it is true that if you get good at argument work, that's going to help you with your academics, it's going to help you professionally, and also, frankly, in your personal life, right? When you think about your relationships, the ability to be good at logical, calm debate rather than impassioned um, argument is going to be is going to be a real skill. And the third one is something that you just brought up over here, and that we'll we'll do today, which is to move kids from opinion and preferences to claims and evidence. And that's a shift, right? Moving from just the opinion that you have yourself. And this is that's a hardship for adults as well as, as children. And the last one is, it's not that we want to separate children from passion and emotion. That's important to note. That actually when you look at those who are really, really skilled at debate and argument, they do use, that they're passionate. But that the passion is harnessed with logic, right? And that logic is a learned skill. 
Um, and it's easy to grow up without a sense of logic, or it's a, it's a thing that you could teach in your, in your school building. So these are the things that we'll work on right now. Is if these are the, some of the, the, the whys, let's think about why we can do some of this work and how we can do some of this work in reading. Um, so reading as in why start with debate and argument about stories that we're reading. So one is going to be to teach children to be more compelling and more reasonable, um, as in to actually listen to the other side of a debate. Saying your own idea, your own claim and evidence is only half of it. The other half is learning to listen to the other side in such a way that you're willing to shift your opinion. The second is going to be you can use debate in your classroom to help children, and when I say children, I mean all the way through 18 year olds, or even frankly my graduate students. <laughs> um, but it's to help them see more in the text that they're reading, to help them attend to more parts of the text. A third is gonna be to come to richer understandings. So not learning to debate, but debating to learn. Right? It's not about, it's, really, it's a really <coughs> significant thing to shift your stance from trying to prove your point to instead learning to bait, to, to come to richer understandings, right? to see more. Um, part of that is going to be in point four here, is this notion of being more nuanced and more complex and having richer perspectives. And the last is going to be simply to have new ways to engage, new ways to engage with text. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read you parts of a story. <laughs> and as you read this story, I'm going to assign you some debating roles. Um, so to do that work, you need a partner. So I'm going to treat you, and basically I'm going to model just like I would if I were the teacher and you were the kids, so that you could try to replicate it. So to start out, you need a partner. And it is actually important in debate work to really try to get into groups of two, not three. And let me just explain the research around that. And that is that when you have partnerships working in a classroom, that's the closest you get to 100% engagement 100% of the time. The minute you move from a partnership to either a three or a four, it's really easy for some kids to not be working. So I'm gonna admire you for a second as you sort yourself into some partnerships. And could you look around and see if someone near you needs, needs a partner? Okay, try that for a second. Get yourself into some partnerships. Work All you need right now just got it. Right. All you need is a partner. No more instructions yet. All right. All right. We'll come in a second. All right. Okay. Um, welcome. Salamu alaikum. So here's what you need to do. Very quickly, can you just decide who's going to be partner A and partner B? Just take a second. Partner A, partner B. So A. All right. Figure <laughs> it out? Okay. So, one thing that we've learned, so I didn't give introductions because I just want to get to it because we have so little time, but I am Mary Aaronworth from Columbia University, um, from Teachers College. We run a think tank on literacy, and we work globally, we work internationally, and the promise that we make to schools is that if we come to help your teachers and your school, that your kids will become better readers and writers. Right? And that's, that's a big promise to make. And one of the things that we've been researching for the last two years is how to help children and young adults get better at argument writing. Right? But it turns out, one of the research groups that we did for two years was it turns out that when you want kids to get better at argument writing, you want to start by improving their talk. It's much faster to coach children in debate and in talk than it is just through writing. Like a lot of lessons that you think are writing lessons 
they're really thinking lessons. And if you can get kids, it's very unlikely that kids will be able to write something they can't say. And so we did a big research project on this over two years, and what we worked on is raising the level of kids' discourse. So their discourse is going to be their ability to say, to express ideas. And what we're really going to work on is getting them to talk as ideas and evidence. Ideas and evidence. Ideas and evidence. So to do that, you need ways to practice it. And what you really need is you need ways for kids to have repeated practice. Because that's not something that you teach in one lesson and they get good at it. In fact, what you really need is a series of opportunities for kids to practice so that you can give them feedback along the way. And let me just explain the research around feedback. I'm sure you've been researching it, but there is one man who's probably done the most research on feedback. His name is John Hattie, and he has a book called Visible Learning for Teachers, which is a really, it's actually a large mega study. It's hard to read, it's a lot of statistics, but I'll sum up one of the most important parts of it. One of the most important things that he learned in this study is he looked at feedback that was affecting performance. So he looked at Olympic divers, he looked at piano players, he looked at, he looked at all kinds of learners. And what he found was that the feedback that most accelerated achievement had three qualities. It was in the moment, so while you're working, it's calibrated, as in it's just a small amount based on what you just did, and it's followed by repeated practice. So actually, for those of us who are here in this room, where he found the most effective feedback that was happening in schools was on the playing fields and in the music rooms. It was the football soccer coaches. It was because your football or soccer coach will literally say, no, don't do that ever again. <laughs> do it like this. And he'll show you, and then you'll get a chance to try it. Same with musicians. Where he found the least effective feedback was English teachers. No. It was try I mean, it's, it's really devastating to read. Because he said so much of the feedback that happened in English came in the form of written comments after the work was done, and it was too late to do anything about it. And in fact, he found that grading has no statistical impact on student achievement. But feedback has a huge statistical impact on student achievement. So at Columbia, with all the schools we work, which are thousands of schools, we've really thought about this, about shifting away from your focus on grading and instead increasing your fo focus on feedback. And feedback has to happen when you're in front of the kid, when you're in front of the child. Like, that's the way you need to give feedback. So this is actually a great thing for English teachers because it means stop taking the kids writing home and instead, give them more feedback while they're in front of you. So what we're going to do right now, really what we're doing is, I'm creating an opportunity for me to give you feedback on your logic and argument. So, okay, so really quickly, for those who just came in, you need a partner, partner A and partner B. Okay, so just make sure you've got a partner A and B. These are going to be your roles. I'm going to read you a story, but you have specific roles. Partner A, you are going to be taking, well, first let me tell you about the story. The story is called Fly Away Home. It's a, it's a, we're reading a fairly accessible text. It's called Fly Away Home, and it's about a young boy who lives in an airport. Right? So it's a boy and his father who live in the airport. And the boy's name is Andrew. But we're not going to read it thinking about just what's happening in the story. We're going to read it taking specific roles. So partner A, your position, listen to the language, your position that you are defending is that the airport is a bad place to live. And it's up to you to define what you mean by that. You mean physically or psychologically, and you have to do that work. Partner B, you have a trickier position. Partner B, you're going to defend the position that the airport, surprisingly, is a good place to live. And it's up to you to define what it means by good. Now, I'm using the word position, I'm going to tell you why. Because in our research, when we started out using the word claim or thesis, kids weren't doing that, their work just wasn't that strong. But when we moved to saying position, they, they seem to understand that term much better. And I think it's because in a lot of sports, you defend a position. Like the notion of defending a position seems metaphoric and, and easier to get to. Okay, so partner A, you know your position? So you have to collect evidence to support your position. I'm gonna give you one tip. Nowhere in the story is the author going to say, 
And so this shows the airport is a good place to live. <laughs> He's never going to do that because e funding, e funding. The author is not making the same argument you are. And this is one of the first things you have to teach kids is that when they're building arguments, the text that they're re they're reading are never going to be making the argument they exactly want. You have to do the intellectual work of saying what evidence here can I use and how can I spin it. Okay, so let's give it a try. Okay, so you ready? Partner A and partner B, you know your position. If there's someone near you who just came in, can you help them, have them join you? They can just be, uh, they can join your partnership? Okay, so it starts like this. You might use images, you might use the images as well as the word. There's the father and Andrew. My dad and I live in an airport. That's because we don't have a home, and the airport is better than the streets. We're careful not to get caught. Mr. Slocum and Mr. Vale were caught last night. Ten green bottles hanging on the wall, they sang. They were as loud as two moose bellowing. Dad says they broke the first rule of living here. Don't get noticed. Dad and I try not to get noticed. We stay among the crowds. We change airlines. There they are. Delta, Tiribue, Northwest, we love them all, Dad says. He and I wear blue jeans and blue t-shirts and blue jackets. We each have a blue zippered bag with a change of blue clothes. Not to be noticed is to look like nobody at all. We'll do one more. Once we saw a woman pushing a metal cart full of stuff. She wore a long, dirty coat, and she lay down across a row of seats in front of Continental Gate 6. The cart, the dirty coat, the lying down were all noticeable. Security moved her out real fast. Okay, so think about your argument. The airport is a good place to live, for example, also in addition. The airport is a bad place to live, for example, also in addition. Okay, you're only going to have, I'm going to give you one tip, you're only going to have one minute to make your position clear, to defend your position. So you might be thinking already, what's your most important evidence? Partner A, five, four, three, two, one, go. Partner A, give it a try. start your argument, make a big, bold claim. Sometimes you get excited and you're going right into your evidence, and kids will do this all the time in their writing. They think their thesis is clear, but we read it and we think, I don't really know where it is. Right? So partner B, can you really make sure you start with, I take the position that, right? and say it really clearly before you go into your evidence. The other thing is partner A didn't get to all their evidence, so make sure that you either make a plan for, if you, do you want to start with your most important? Or do you want to build up to it? But either way, you're only going to have a minute. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, go. <laughs> all their evidence, you just spoke faster. <laughs> but what I want to get you to do is to actually think about your organization rather than your pace, right? To think, what are you going to lead with? 
Um, however, there was one thing that partner B was doing that we should call out, because partner A, you could do it next time, is because they were thinking about whether their evidence was more important or less, instead of using transitions like, for example, also in addition, they were using transitions that were more like, most importantly, or surprisingly, which is a more sophisticated transition, right? Because you're letting your, your, your reader know or your opponent know. So right now, though, before we go on, I want to do one really important thing that you're going to want to start doing all the time. Can you turn to your opponent and can both of you say, what was your opponent's best point? What did you find most convincing of what they said? Go ahead. What was their most convincing point? <laughs> All right. All right, readers and thinkers. So I'm going to keep modeling for a little bit like a teacher right now. So let me give you some feedback. Uh, this, this word is a word you want to start using with kids all the time. It's a word coaches use. I want to give you some feedback. So the feedback. So I want to give you some feedback on what you're doing well and what you could actually get a lot better at really quickly, as in right now. Um, so what you're doing well is you are not waiting for the book to make the argument for you. Right? You are, in fact, looking for things and saying, this, this moment, this could be an example of. That's that you're doing really well. But I will say that you're not that specific in your evidence. You're mostly quoting the plot, what happened. And that's partly because you're not jotting enough. You're not taking notes enough. And so one of the things is, if you're relying on your long-term memory, that's not going to work out that well. Right? And in fact, it turns out it's really an important skill to be able, when someone is lecturing or talking, to be able to jot notes. I think about when I talk to my eighth graders, I'll say to them, when you're in an internship, at the end of the day, and you're like, say you're interning at Google, and there's 40 young people all <coughs> interning, and during the day, they have a lot of meetings. If you're the one who can come up at the end of the meeting and say to the person, I was really struck by what you said. And you can get your notes out and read it them. You're the one who is going to get a job. So like, don't take notes for me, but take notes for you. Right? Because that, that's the ability to be specific, is because you actually are specific. It is sometimes you will hear some, some phrase that you feel like that, I want to quote specifically. I want to say, for example, in the book, it said, and actually get the whole sentence or phrase. So let's do one quick more round just of that, because I think you could do better. Um, but there's two ways you can get better. So one is going to be your note taking. And the second is going to be, when you make an argument, there's what's called a ladder of abstraction. And the ladder of abstraction moves like this. Roy Peter Clark, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, he's written about this. He talks about how the first or the bottom rung is simply idea and evidence. So I could say the airport is a good place to live. For example, uh, it's, it's safe from the outdoors. Another, you know, a, and, I, and I could give a little example. But what I'm already doing there is I'm just saying, for example, it's a higher level of interaction if I can do claims, reason, evidence. So, Reasons would be, I've got like three reasons it's safe. It's safe from the outdoors, and I've got some examples for that. It's safe uh, emotionally, and I've got examples for that. Or maybe another third reason might be uh, because they can be intimate with each other. The father and son can be intimate. A lot of kids never get to see their families. We use them all the time. But see how I'm not just doing evidence. I'm doing reasons first. That's actually a lot harder. And it's usually related to how well you know your topic. So a lot of times with teachers, you think the kids are breaking down with logic, but they just don't know enough about what they're writing about. Like they go to write about a book and they don't know the book well enough. Or they go to write about history and they don't know enough history to write well. So when you want to be able to say reasons and evidence, you have to know quite a bit. So let's try it again for a minute. Sorry. And this time, let's just go and see if you and your partner can A, do any jotting, but then you can also see if you can organize your argument as reasons or an evidence. So let's, partner A, you know your position, we'll go back a little bit and we'll reread. We're right at Delta, Team Ray, Northwest, we love them all, Dad says. He and I wear blue jeans and blue t-shirts and blue jackets. We each have a blue zippered bag with a change of blue clothes. Not to be noticed is to look like nobody at all. Is there anything for the image you want to use? Once we saw a woman pushing a metal cart full of stuff. She wore a long, dirty coat, and she lay down across a row of seats in front of Continental Gate 6. 
The cart, the dirty coat, the lying down were all noticeable. Security moved her out real fast. Dad and I sleep sitting up. We use different airport areas. Where are we tonight, I ask? Dad checks his notebook. Alaska Air, he says, over in the other terminal. That's okay. We like to walk. We know some of the airport regulars by name and by sight. There's Idaho Joe and Annie Franny and Mars Man. But we don't sit together. Sitting together will get you noticed faster than anything, Dad says. Everything in the airport's on the move. Passengers, pilots, flight attendants, cleaners in their brooms. Jets roar in close to the windows. Other jets roar out. Luggage bounces down chutes. Escalators glide up and down, disappearing under floors. Everyone's going somewhere except Dad and me. We stay. Okay, so you might, if you were going to plan, you might jot. What's your big idea? What are some reasons underneath it? Do you have any reasons underneath this? I think the position at the airport is a safe place to live, is a good place to live because ABC. I think the position at the airport is a bad place to live because ABC. And this is where it's actually tricky, is that the evidence came in a certain order in the story, but you have to reorder it under your points, under your reasons. And that, we, we've now realized that's trickier for kids than we thought. So like, you've got all these examples from the book but they weren't presented in the same order as your reasons. You have to reorder them. It's called, the language for that is called correlating details. You're taking the details, the supporting details, and you're gonna correlate them to each of your points. So try, which is actually, it's, it's a little tricky. So try that for a second. Got your idea, your reasons. Partner A, remember all the ways you're gonna do it even better? Big, bold claim, right? More sophisticated transitions, not just first, next, then, but like most importantly or more surprisingly. Right? Okay, four, four, three, two, one. Get a try. Just as your position. something like, while it's true, or even though, and then you can go into nevertheless, and think like, what would you say about your opponent's position as you lead into yours? Five, four, three, two, one, partner B. <laughs> idea and evidence to claim reason evidence. Now you're also beginning to acknowledge your opponent's counter argument a little bit. You're, you're acknowledging the other side a little bit. We're going to take it up a notch. So far we've just been arguing about characters and setting. 
Let's go to theme, which will be more, a little more complex, a little more complicated. So when we want to argue about theme, I'm going to give you positions again. And this, I will tell you afterwards, is something we learned from our research, that when, when kids are doing all the skills at one time, a lot of it breaks down and you're not sure when. So we're doing some skill isolation. I'm giving you your position, and I'm watching how you can argue that. So partner A. We're going to look at two themes in this book. We'll look at the theme of love and the theme of hope. All right? So partner A, your position is going to be that Eve Bunting, that's the author, in Fly Away Home, suggests that one of the most important themes in this book is love. That when times are hard and things are tough, all you really need is love. All right? So you've got your whole... See, and one of the things you want to move to is... A claim or a thesis is not a word, it's a sentence, right? It's a whole little paragraph. So when times are hard and things are tough, all you really need is love. Partner B, it's hard to argue against that, but partner B, you are going to argue that actually the more important lesson that she teaches is that when times are hard and things are tough, all you really need is hope. So love or hope. Not the other one's wrong, so you're looking for which is stronger in the text. Where does she prove it? Once again, there's never going to be a moment when she says, and so this shows that all you need is love. <laughs> right? That's never going to happen. All right? So we're not going to reread. So think to yourself, was there anything that already came up that you would put? Any evidence already in the story? Let's go on a little bit and see. Okay. So you're looking for evidence that love matters, evidence that hope matters. Other jets roar out, luggage bounces down chutes, escalators glide up and down, disappearing under floors. Everyone is going somewhere except Dad and me. We stay. Once a little brown bird got into the main terminal and clicked it out. It fluttered on the high, hollow spaces. It threw itself at the glass, fell panting on the floor, flew to a tall metal girder, and perched there, exhausted. Don't stop trying, I told it silently. Don't. You can get out. For days the bird flew around, dragging one wing. And then it found the moment when a sliding door was open and slipped through. I watched it rise. Its wings seemed okay. Fly, bird, I whispered. Fly away, home. Though I couldn't hear it, I knew it was singing. Nothing made me as happy as that bird. And there's this image of them. The airport's busy and noisy even at night. Dad and I sleep anyway. When it gets quiet between 2 and 4 a.m., we wake up. Dead time, Dad says. Almost no flights coming in or going out. At dead time, there aren't many people around, so we're extra careful. In the mornings, Dad and I wash up in one of the bathrooms, and he shaves. The bathrooms are crowded no matter how early, and that's the way we like it. Strangers talk to strangers. Where'd you get in from? Three hours our flight was delayed. Man, am I bushed. Dad and I... We don't talk to anyone. We buy donuts and milk for breakfast at one of the cafeterias, standing in line with our red trays. Sometimes, Dad gets me a carton of juice. On the weekends, Dad takes the bus to work. He's a janitor in an office in the city. The bus fares a dollar each way. On those days, Mrs. Medina looks out for me. The Medinas live at an airport, too. Grandma, Mrs. Medina, and Denny, who's my friend. He and I collect rented luggage cards that people have left outside and return them for 50 cents each. If the crowds are big and safe, we offer to carry bags. Get this one for you, lady? Looks heavy. Or can I call you a cab? Denny's real good at calling cabs. Taxis. That's because he's seven already. Sometimes passengers don't tip. Then Denny whispers, stingy. But he doesn't whisper too loud. The Medinas understand that it's dangerous to be noticed. When Dad comes back from work, he buys hamburgers for us in the Medinas. There's no, pay, there's no pay for them for watching out for me. If Denny and I have had a good day, oh, we treat for gas. No, we, treat, we treat for pie. But I've stopped doing that. I save my money and my shoe. Will we ever have our own apartment again, I asked Dad. I'd like it to be the way it was before Mom died. Maybe we will, he says, if I can find more work, if we can save some money. He rubs my head. It's nice right here, though, isn't it, Andrew? It's warm, it's safe, and the price is right. Okay, so let's pause there. So evidence that this story is really teaching that when times are hard, all you really need is love? Or is it more? This story is really teaching that when times are hard, all you really need is hope. Under A. 
Partner A, I am going to ask you to do a more sophisticated introduction to your position. Mm -hmm. So this time, can you mention the author and the title as you go into So I take the position, and I mention that Fly Away Home by E. Bunting teaches that, right? Or suggests, or teaches the lesson. Right? So get the whole author. It's E. Bunting, it's Fly Away Home. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Partner A, give it a try. <laughs> was saying things like, while you said, or I heard you say, it's also lovely to get some language in like, it's interesting what you said, or while it's intriguing your point, nevertheless. So it doesn't, debate doesn't always have to be confrontational. It can be that I saw your point, and yet I see it differently. And there's another way to look at it. So think about the language of complexity, not the language of confrontation. Okay? Five, four, three, two, one, partner B. Lesson, such as that all you need is love when things are hard. That's a whole paragraph, right? It's not just one little sentence. You're doing that really well. I do think that sometimes you are saying the evidence from the story and expecting it to explain itself. Like there's a little bit sometimes where you say, for example, in the story, he watches a bird fly and he says, fly away home. And then you move into your next piece of evidence. You actually want to pause there and say, this is important because or this illustrates, or this shows. You need to, we call it framing the evidence, you need to unpack it for your reader or your, your audience. This, you have to explain why it's important. Some of you were doing that, but there's a little more anal like, that analysis is important. <clears throat> Let's try one last very quick round, and the reason I want to do that is it will help you with this framing of evidence, is another way so we've done, we did character and setting, then we did some theme work. So now let's do a little bit of work with author's craft, which actually looking at how the author is making his or her point. So this time, here are your positions. Both partner A and partner B are going to be taking the position that Eve Bunting suggests that the airport is a frightening place, okay? frightening or ominous. If you have young kids, you would say scary. If you have older kids, I'd use the... And what we're really looking now is at tone, right? At the tone of the story. But at the beginning, one thing that Eve Bunting does is this is not really a... It's not a happy-go-lucky. It's, it's not a playground, right? She sets it up so the tone is kind of ominous. But partner A, I want you to take the position that the way, the most, the strongest way that Eve Bunting creates that tone is through the images. In particular, which images? Partner B, again, sorry, partner B, yours is a little trickier. You are going to take the position that the strongest way she creates that tone is through the language. In particular, which words? Okay, you know what you're doing? So let's take a look. So you're collecting evidence for what's the strongest way, images or words, in particular, which image, which word. You might get something right from the type from the cover page. There's the cover. Fly away home. There's the first image. And the father. My dad and I live in an airport. That's because we don't have a home, and the airport is better than the streets. 
We're careful not to get caught. Mr. Slocum and Mr. Vale were caught last night. Ten green bottles hanging on the wall, they sang. They were as loud as two moose bellowing. Dad says they broke the first rule of living here. Don't get noticed. Dad and I try not to get noticed. We stand among the crowd. We change airlines. Delta, TWA, Northwest, we love them all, Dad says. He and I wear blue jeans and blue t-shirts and blue jackets. We each have a blue zipper bag with a change of blue clothes. Not to be noticed, but to look like nobody at all. Okay, so we're just going to go there. So if you're thinking, which image? <clears throat> which words? Hold your hand. Partner A. Five, four, three, two, one. Are you punching create the tone? That's really close analysis. So let's just think about the levels that we just did. We started with character and setting, then we went to some thematic work, but right? now we're working about author's craft, which is tricky and harder. Um, but there's some one thing that we did that was really strategic, is I'm doing high-level thinking work with you, but I'm doing it on an accessible text. And a lot of times what's happening with kids in school is as we're introducing the high, hard-level work, <coughs> it's also on high, hard-level text, and then they're struggling on all fronts. And you think they're struggling with the writing or the logic, but they're really struggling just with their grasp of the text as well. So when you first start this work, you want to start it on texts that are going to be accessible, that will reward it. And another thing we did is we built towards complexity. So let me just, if you want to try this in your schools, I'm just going to lay out a little protocol for you. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so these are some of the things that we just did. We're working on these things. We're working on supporting ideas with evidence. We're working on deepening language. I'm also coaching you on the technical language of argument, right? On the language of claim, reason, evidence, counterclaim. This, through repeated practice, we're working on this defending positions with fluency, and but also with grace. So we're moving kids away from, I disagree. So we're moving kids more towards, there's maybe another way to see that. Or this is a complicated, you know, like, it's basically moving towards complexity. And then gradually, this acknowledging of counter arguments. That move, when you do it, don't forget to do the thing where the kids have to pause and say back their opponent's best point. Because otherwise what happens is the kids sit there and they're only thinking about their own side. And they're not even listening to the other side. Right. But if you move to, they know that it's like a ritual. You're always going to have to say back, what was your best point? They get used to acknowledging counter arguments. So if you want to do this work, let me just lay out the protocol we just used and give you a little bit of research around it. So this was, we did a lot of research with um, some researchers from, it's in the United States it's called ETS, Educational Testing Service. They write the college boards and the SATs and all the rest. And one thing that they told us is they said that some of our instruction, we were doing too many skills at one time, and then we couldn't give the kids feedback on those skills. So they suggested that we give the kids the argument, 
and they're supporting either side. As in, I didn't say to you, to, I didn't start out by saying, partner A, come up with a position you can defend. Because now all your intellectual work is going into that, and I can't tell where you're having trouble. I gave you the position, and that was really liberating for me, because I'd always felt as a teacher, I'm not allowed to tell you anything, right? But sometimes when you're practicing, you can tell the kids. So I, I gave you positions, and you had partner positions. Um, then you were doing this close reading together evidence, and I coached you a little bit on that. I coached you on rereading. I coached you on jotting and taking notes, right? So you let them, you let them do a little work, and then you give them some feedback. You're defending positions. I'm giving calibrated feedback. So what calibrated feedback means, and this came from John Hattie, is it's just, a, we call it a snippet, a little bit at a time. I didn't start by saying to you, take a big, bold position, use sophisticated transitions, listen to your poem. Each time I gave you just a little bit. So you're pacing out your feedback so that you just get a little bit that you're applying one thing at a time. And the last thing is that we had repeated practice, so we were layering towards complexity. And we start with character and setting, lesson and theme, then author's craft. You can picture, we could then do it on harder text or a different text. We could go across text. You can picture how you could keep going. But the main thing is, if I said to you now, if you were going to write a literary essay right now, would you feel fairly, would you have rehearsed your literary essay right now? If you were going to write an essay about either the character or the theme or the craft in E. Bunting's Fly Away Home, that talk will be rehearsal for their writing. And it's so much faster and more effective to give kids feedback while they're rehearsing their writing than after they've written. That's the big thing. So why don't I pause there and why don't you just say to someone near you, what did that work? Would you want to try out in your own building? What, what do you want to try when you go back? What do you think? <laughs> Okay, friends, let's stop there. Um, I think I will see if I can just go to our website. Uh, our, our website has some of this written up, and you can also just email me about it. But, um, sorry. Let me just show you one place that might be helpful for you. Oh, we're not connected right now. At readingandwritingproject.org, we have put together a lot of texts, of recommended texts, that are, are helpful for argument work. So let me just see if this will come up. Uh, no, sorry. Readingandwritingproject.org, where underneath on our website, we have under, it says digital text sets, we've put together texts that would be, that are on different sides of arguments that you can practice them with kids. And the main thing I would say is that when you go back to do this work with kids, is don't think that you have to give them all the work on the first go. And don't make these debates into something so big and fancy that you'll never do it. Like the whole point of flash debate is that you can do them in five minutes, you can do them in 10 minutes, and each time you get a little better. So it's basically this notion that you're pacing it out to get them started. I just want to make sure you get my email at the beginning if you need it. Um, you get them started, and then gradually you give them feedback. There you go. Oops, oh, you're already on my page. Sorry. So, one thing my computer is to do the trouble just when you don't want it. There you go. So this is our website, readingandwritingproject.org. And when you, if you want, visit it and go down under resources. You can look at digital text sets. And there's a lot of. We basically organize them by uh, current events, social studies topics, and science topics. But those will probably be, be helpful for you. And then if you have questions, you can just email me or if you've got, you want to start the work. But the main thing I would say is. Don't wait. Like start it tomorrow. Like start it Tuesday when you go back, um, and then pace it out across your curriculum. All right. So let's stop there. And we have a many, 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 many things to do across this conference. I have. Um, I'm doing one this afternoon on essay camp, which is sort of the next step of this. When you want to move from the debate 
to then get them to organize it for writing. So that might be a helpful for some of you. Okay? All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you.